Jack, one, two, three. All righty, let's see if we've got everything we need here. Uh, we got the Yeti microphone, we got the speakers, we got the video, <clears throat> got the haircut, uh, video, make sure we've got the right camera, correct, okay. All right, participants, just me, panelist. Okay, hopefully everybody will be able to hear me okay. Let's do a little share. Okay, all panels, gotcha. And share. And we'll share that. Take a shot of me. Um, how do I invite a panelist? This is Curtis. Hey, Jay. I think I forgot to set you up as a panelist in advance, so I can't join you until I start the broadcast, which I will do forthwith. And then we'll just, okay. I'll just leave it on the landing screen slide until we get rolling right at noon, okay? Okay. But you and I can test it out before then, so. 
Sounds great. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right, the webinar is now broadcasting to all attendees. Attendees will automatically be placed in the... All right. Hi, Todd, I just promoted you to panelist. You're on mute, though, which is fine. We got people coming on all bo on board already. Thank you for doing that. We'll be starting here in just a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, just kind of hang loose. Jay, I am now going to promote you to panelists. And there you are. Hi. You're also good, muted, but good morning. <laughs> there you are. Good morning. All right. So we got the trioka of heavy hitters here that will be part of our discussion. And um, Jay has a nice backdrop, which I was going to do with my C-band banner, but I couldn't figure out a way to hang it behind me in such a way that people could see it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a, just a slide here until we get rolling. I'm also just going to go ahead and mute you for now, Jay. All right, thanks. You bet.
T minus one minute and counting. Well, there you go. Did you hear me before? No. So there was nothing. No. Okay. Well, that's that's why that's why we're in technology, right? <laughs> um, I was just welcoming everybody to the uh, C-band lunch and learn. Uh, today's edition is called uh, uh, "Public Libraries: The Bridge Over the Divi Digital Divide" or "A Bridge Over the Digital Divide." And I'm Curtis Dean with uh, C-band. Todd Kielkoff, also with C-Band, is here on uh, the panel today as well, and we'd like to welcome our attendees. Some of you are already C-Band members, and if you're not, we welcome you to become a C-Band member by going to broadbandaction.com and signing up. Our panelist today on the topic of libraries is uh, Jay Peterson, and Jay is the district consultant for the State Library of Iowa. Specifically, he represents works with public libraries in the North Central District of Iowa. So, Jay, thanks for uh, coming on and being part of our discussion today. Uh, thank you so much, Curtis. Uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, if you can't hear me, then uh, do like you guys did and give me a thumbs down, right? <laughs> no, we can hear you. <laughs> uh, I guess if Excellent. I can hear you then, then and Todd can hear you, then our, uh, our guests can hear us, so. Yeah, and uh, uh, thanks so much for, for inviting me on today, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing lots of uh, questions from all of you here. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, maybe start some slides just to uh, have a little bit of an, an introduction, but uh, uh, when I say North Central, I'm covering, I cover 89 libraries that are in around Mason City. So that's kind of like the zone I'd say I do but we have uh, consultants here that cover regions of the whole state. So right. we divide those libraries up. Do you have in Iowa? So we have six totals. So we have six okay. districts that, that cover that. So, um, so there's a, there's going to be wherever you're at, wherever you're coming to this from, there's an equivalent of me in your region, most likely. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, we're going to jump to my slides real quick here. And, uh, so is that going through? I think it is, right? It is. I'm not sure if it's full screen or not, but. Um, it's looking okay on my end, I guess. Okay. What is this? The, are you seeing this side? I'm seeing, I'm yeah, I'm seeing the notes and the slides on the bottom too. Okay. I got dual screens going here and that's not helping. That's uh, one of the problems I run into when I do these, so. Screen two, let's do that. Better. There we go. There we go. So uh, uh, I work for the State Library of Iowa. Very quickly, we're an agency that um, helps libraries uh, with a, with all kinds of things that they need. But specifically, my area helps um, uh, public libraries as our primary customer. Um, 
and that's mostly small and rural public libraries in Iowa. They're they're um, they're uh, roughly seventy percent of them serve populations of two thousand and le or less. Uh, I have a great many libraries that are covering towns of you know under two hundred people in some cases, but you know most of our customers are are, are from very small towns. Um, and there, that is true. There's 544 uh, separate public libraries that separate libraries with with their own boards of trustees, uh, all with their own issues. It's 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 good in some ways because it uh, lets for a lot of diversity in, in, in the libraries that we have and, and um, a lot of community buy in, uh, in in those libraries, which which is excellent. Um, but it means we have a lot of a lot of different groups that we have to coordinate with and and. Um, we don't have, say, big, like other states have big library districts with lots of branches, and we really don't have that very much in Iowa. We have we have a few, but not very many. Um, and uh, although our libraries are, are eligible for E-rate, if if you're all familiar with the E-rate program, um, it and it um, it gives you know provides internet to internet to uh, school public schools. And it also included in a little add on there, it, it, it allowed for access to public libraries as well. And um, for the past uh, 11 years approximately, I was working as an E-rate coordinator for public libraries here in Iowa. So I know really well the, the trials and tribulations that the libraries have uh, applying for E-rate. Um, we used to do a lot more E-rate at libraries uh, when the phone was still included in that. Um, and we've been encouraging libraries to keep to keep doing E-rate um, to, to help pay for their internet connectivity. Uh, but you know, as you can see with all these different boards and all these differences of no opinion and uh, <clears throat> libraries are very defensive of um, their uh, freedom. You know, they don't want to censor, they don't want to put filters on their computers. So um, the Children's Internet Protection Act, which you may be familiar with, uh, that comes with those E-rate funds. Uh, is a, is a, there's a little bit of pushback um, from our public libraries about that. And part of our job is kind of talking to them, persuading them about, about filters that they might be leaving a lot of money on the table uh, in terms of what they could fund for their internet. Um, and I, I could talk more about that, that later as well, but uh, you know, maybe some of you are aware that uh, with E-rate, uh, you can also have uh, fiber builds to the libraries. And so we're trying to talk to libraries about about building fiber and network connectivity, that last mile stuff that's that's so expensive. Um, we're trying to get libraries to do that. And we've had um, some success with that. We've had a few libraries actually go through um, and jump through the, the hoops to get all the all the um, money to do that that last mile connectivity, which is which is really great. Um, but overall, you know, we, we we would love to see more E-rate funds go to libraries. Uh, they of course go to public schools to you know the tunes of millions and millions of dollars and we don't in Iowa and we don't uh, get anywhere near that here um, maybe we're at half a million dollars or something like that total um, but we're really stressing with libraries that no matter how you do it whether you use e-rate or not um, you want to get the best connection you can for you know a lot of reasons um, mo but mostly because of this we, we want them to stress you know the light the internet's not going away um, people are going to keep bringing devices into your library, whether you like it or not. They're going to all have laptops. They're all going to have smartphones. They're all going to have one-to-one -one computers and Chromebooks, and the kids are going to go crazy when they don't. When the internet goes down, that's never going away. It's just as important as your library materials. So when I talk to all these library boards that I have out there, I stress, you know, I know you, you know, maybe you're not into computers. You join this library board because you love books, and and that's wonderful. We all, we all love library materials. We all love what public libraries do by helping children read and getting books in the hands of people that need them and all that sort of great stuff. But you put a ton of money into your, to your collection and you're not putting a ton of money into your connectivity, into your internet, the library. And that's a, that's a big thing we wanna strive for, to put those on the same level, that you should have that kind of money invested in, in getting a good connection at your library. So, um, that's a rough overview of our libraries, uh, but I want to go back and talk about uh, some of the things we've done here uh, at the state library, and and um, kind of just to get a get an assess of of uh, broadband and connectivity in our state. Uh, uh, but first off, the past year we've uh, we've been excited about the Future Ready Iowa program that's being 
um, you know, that's being pu pushed by Iowa Workforce Development, the governor's office. We went to a bunch of their sessions they've had around the state. And, uh, you know, a major focus of this is getting the workforce uh, educated, uh, getting them trained up on new skills, you know, bringing them to the table wherever they can, you know, reaching them in those rural areas, getting them access to training, you know, and a big part of that should be public libraries. It needs to be a place where, you know, job seekers can go to look for jobs, where people can go to get training if they need help. We even have libraries that do test proctoring, that sort of thing online. Um, we even we even have our libraries do, trying to do things like um, checking out uh, cellular hotspots to library patrons so they can check out a cellular hotspot so they can have connection at their home that they maybe can't afford or don't have very good connection so they can take a, a test or an online class, whatever it might be, um, from the comfort of their own home. But we're really, we're really excited that the Future Ready uh, initiative is coming with, you know, an more broadband initiatives. It's trying to bring in more cellular coverage across rural areas, which is which is great. Uh, but we're very we're very much hoping that um, libraries can, you know, be treated as what they are, which is kind of a community anchor institution. We work with some other national groups, um, the Shelby Group that that uh, does that. It 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 uh, supports uh, libraries and hospitals as anchor institutions and communities and schools. And um, we're kind of trying to take that to the future ready thing and say, you know, this library is an anchor institution as well. Please, um, you know, please consider them when you're talking about this legislation. But a big part of that is libraries really need quality connections. You know, a, a library can't, for example, apply E-rate funds to getting cellular. Uh, so that's a frustration for us. You know, we can't. So if, if, you, if a bill comes through and says we're going to improve cellular connections well okay but we also need to have an option for us helping to get better um, wire connections you know and um, very very few of our libraries have anything approaching fiber um, they're almost all cable modem we're getting we're getting um, far away from um, the DSL subscriber line type of thing or the uh, copper wire wire sort of connections through like CenturyLink or places like that um, so that, that at least is improving. I think in the past 10 years, I've seen that, you know, going up, but it could always get better. Um, and so we've done some studies and stuff and such in the past and, and we'll talk a little bit more about those, but, um, you know, future ready is just a really exciting thing. I think if you go to the future ready site, if you're at all interested in, you know, you're an employer, you're a mentor, you're working with these sort of groups, please go talk to them and please include public libraries when you're having this conversation because, you know, we really, that's a place where people go to get help where these people you want to, 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 to take up these um, jobs, you know, are in those communities. And um, we know firsthand from the, from the librarians that they have a lot of people coming through their door um, looking for this sort of help and they need good connections. And maybe the only good connection is at their library. Um, we had a big, uh, a multi-state um, test program uh, that was uh, E-rate advocacy program that was called um, LEAP, uh, and it involves some big states and ALA, and we were one of the states that also was included in that. Um, uh, we tried really hard to um, really do a, a lot of soul searching about how we used E-rate in the state, how, how libraries used it, how our staff learned about it, so we came up with a whole system of cross-training our staff. So a lot of our people are now kind of E-rate experts and can help the librarians, you know, get through that because it shouldn't be, it is a, a really heinous process for a public library to do an E-rate application. You know, it's one thing, you know, a public school, you have people who um, are IT pros or at least really know IT well, and they can be focused on doing that E-rate application because it's worth, you know, millions of dollars um the the school level i mean the at the library level they're working you know really hard on doing an application that may only net them 200 300 dollars so it's a lot of work and they need a lot of hand holding to get that through because it's it's such a technical process and the forms are are a real burden you know the, the, a lot of these library directors have never done an rfp they have no idea what that is so it's a lot to take on for a, at a public library um, so that's, but part of that, we got roped into um, 
a digital inclusion survey. And we went and came up with this, you know, did this great survey and, and got a bunch of our libraries on board. And we got some really good data from a, from a bunch of them about um, where their speeds are, what they're reporting, where they're at. So this is about two, three years old now. But you can see there, not a lot of our libraries in that sample size are above 25. It's pretty low. And um, that there are a lot that are just above nine, you know, maybe. Uh, but, you know, that's one thing we can kind of say has gotten better is that we don't have quite so many that are at five. I mean, there were, there were literally ones that were that low out there. And so that, that's improved over time. They've invested more money in it. And um, I'd say for my, my region, my 89 libraries, they're, they're much more in this um, uh, 20, you know, above 25 range across the board, which is still low. I mean, you could argue that that's low and it needs to be better. Um, but, uh, Jay, Jay yeah. this is Curtis. If I could just kind of yeah. elaborate on that. That just is a shocking statistic to me. And yeah, it may be a couple of years old, but it's just blows my mind that only 14% of the libraries of the ones that responded to this have a 25 meg connection or greater, especially when, as you mentioned there, that's what the federal government considers to be broadband, meaning that a lot of people, a lot of libraries don't even have broadband. They have internet, but not broadband. So what, what, are, what are the primary barriers there? And if I'm jumping the gun on some of your presentation here, just let me know. But um, what's holding people back? Is it cost? Is it availability? Is it a combination? It's, it's, a, um, it's availability. I mean, you know, how there – we had another uh, survey that we kind of had too that was from uh, Broadband Nation. And, you know, it came back. We tried to get the, the provider side of things. And we had a lot of this coverage issue that was like – well, okay, we've got coverage, we've got these things. Well, the libraries can't use those providers because they were either satellite or they were cellular. And so that was that was a burden. And then so then you're left with like one or two maybe um, providers and um, depending on, you know, the, the telcos and that sort of thing in the area, they might have really good or might really, really, really bad. And it, and it does fall down to like their um, vanishingly small libraries, one person operations, they barely have time to, to do the, price searching and finding and they just kind of you know they've been eating sand for so long they don't know <laughs> something better you know um, they don't know what up is I mean mm. you know and, and I've had them I've had them finally get a better connection or get promoted to better connection and go all these things got better and more people started coming in the library once we increased our speed you know there were all these people in our community that were just waiting for this opportunity to use our library so um, yeah, that's kind of why we're interested in talking to, to this group as well, because we just we need to know more. Our librarians need to know about the provider side. They just kind of think, well, we'll get what we get, and we won't throw a fit about our connection. And that's right. we're trying to get them over that hurdle. Um, but it's it's an, it's an education. It's an ongoing process. Absolutely. Well, I you know I, I could understand that um, access might be an issue, right? Because I do know that there are communities, particularly those small rural communities, where maybe there is one provider that can do a 25 meg service or above. Uh, in a lot of cases, there's only one. Um, and I can also imagine how expense, cost could be a big concern because, um, you know, as you, you know, can probably speak to, uh, most small rural uh, public libraries are operating on primarily a pretty shoestring budget, aren't they? Yeah, I, there's one specific story I'd say, and it was a provider that was not going, it, the, they weren't getting their reimbursement back. Um, and they literally wrote a letter to the, to the person and said, you know, the people and said, uh, we need this reimbursement. It's $200. It's holding up our entire summer reading program because that's the money we use. You know, that's the kind of amount we're talking about, you know, so it, it's, it is, it is very small budgets. And, you know, sometimes we have providers that are great and give a free connection and it's hard to make the argument for E-rate when there's a free connection coming in. But, you know, if we could pay a little bit more and then combo with E-rate and do a little bit better connection, that's kind of what we're trying to argue. But um, right. I do have a few really great places that have really good providers and they get excellent connections for nothing. And it's hard to argue to do E-rate when it's, it's a, it's a good connection and it's free. And I wish there were more, I wish there were more of that. So that's, well, that's, and you, as you mentioned, E-rate is, that's a, it's, it's a paperwork hurdle to climb. And if you are a, a small library or a librarian at a small community and you are a half-time employee and you're trying to keep the lights on and do all these other things, 
having the time and just the, the knowledge and capacity to jump through the E-rate hoops might be more than you can handle. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, they get, they, they almost get waved off right away just on like the filtering requirement, having to license a filter, put that on. Um, that'll stop. So that is a requirement of E-rate f- uh, reimbursements. Yeah. They have to have a technology pr- protection measure in place. They have to have a public meeting saying they're going to put it in place. Um, and it has to be there by that time they start the services they're going to get reimbursed for. So, and they don't get, they can't get E-rate funds to apply towards it. So they have to afford the filter in the first place. But interesting. in a lot so of that's cases, that's a regulatory hurdle they have to clear if they even want to seek out that funding. Right, right. And it's not like um, in the public schools where um, because of student protection laws and that sort of thing, all this filtering stuff is just baked right into the, the cost. It doesn't happen so much with the libraries. They have to figure out how to license it. And we're, and we're talking about really small um, libraries where um, there may be only two or three public access computers tops, you know, and you got to work on, on installing that, you know, and it's a two or $300 cost. Like I said, that's, that's a lot for them. And, and then, like I said, doing all the other things, trying to keep records, you know, get audited. You have libraries that get audited for this stuff and it's like a $4,000, you know, thing. And they, wow. <laughs> just, it's a lot of work and a lot of hassle for them, you know, so you want to make it worth it. And I don't know if it's, if it's worth it all the time, you know, I wish it was a little bit, um, they were getting more bang for their buck in some cases. We, and you know, we don't have a lot of libraries either that, that um, get the super high end discounts either. I mean, most of them fall, you know, most of them fall in the 60, 70% range on their monthly right. bills. So, which, which is good, but you know, when you're not paying a whole lot for your connection to begin with, it's a little, little difficult to justify the, the frame. Yeah, if, that, if that expense is only getting you five bucks back, it's not worth the time it takes to fill out the paperwork. Yeah. And, and boy, they, you know, that this one, I don't want to go to E-rate jail. You know, it's like there's no E-rate jail. There's no, they're not good. Nobody wants to get in trouble with the feds. That's for sure. Hey, right. uh, I, I've unmuted Todd uh, Kilkoff, um, if he has anything to um, add here. And, and Todd, you've got an interesting background, not to uh, take away Jay's thunder. And I know you might have a couple more slides, Jay, but Todd, you used to you you actually played a role in in administering finances for a house or for a I'm sorry a library and getting a new one built in Columbia, Missouri. So you, you probably yeah. are nodding your head at a lot of what you're hearing here. Yeah, they you know down there the libraries are their own uh, taxing authorities, uh, independent of the city, and so they can also do joint use agreements and things. So this was a three counties and one city system that all kind of had a. Daniel Boone Regional Library Network, or the equivalent of, and yeah, you know the the E-rate stuff gets baked into the cake, so to speak, from the taxes over time, and then it becomes not really a net benefit; it just becomes part of the cost structure of operations, and then quality <clears throat> doesn't get upgraded because it's still a new cost, and that's just inherent. In right. <clears throat> Excuse me, in long-term budgets. Great. Well, yeah. Jay, I don't. I, I want you to go ahead and uh, continue on with the pr- uh, prepared materials you have here, and then I, obviously I've got I got a ton of questions. I'm thinking as we go on, <laughs> uh, in particular well, about that uh, that role of helping f- cross that divide. Well, well, this is our this is our whiz bang slide here. You know, so <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, okay. You um, spent a lot of time on that one. That looks, <laughs> that looks really good. Um, we have we have some good marketing people. Thank goodness. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but we uh, we we did kind of uh, incorporate that into our into our operations a little bit. This is so we each each of our regions have a little um, map that's still on our page, and you can kind of and they can kind of self report the area. And so the idea behind this is you could speak to that. Um, that uh, speed conversation and knowing what providers are out there because the hope is that you could look at this and say, so a library that's green on this map, you know, has an over 25 connection. Well, if you're um, one of these other libraries around it that doesn't have as high of a connection, you'd call that other library and say like, what provider are you using? Can you have them work in my area? It was kind of the, the idea behind this, but it gives you a, a, a sample like some of these places have really good connections some of them don't have so good and you can see i would say specifically winnebago county up there in mind they'll have, they have really good connections they have a really good provider that that's um um the telecom up there gives them all this great connection and they all are happy to report it you know so 
getting this granular low level stuff information on, on what the, 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 the libraries are actually getting provided for speed has been a big struggle. We've been trying to get that sort of stuff. And so a big part of that is working with the, the urban uh, libraries council and they've worked with uh, Indiana and Texas and a bunch of other States and done this big, um, they do this big survey uh, basically for the library directors where they go through, you know, real fine tooth comb through all their technology stuff and then compare it across baselines of all the other libraries that have done the same edge survey. And that comes out with all these action plans. So we're folding this into all the stuff we do, trying to get the libraries to do one of these edge surveys, compare their baseline against their peers basically, because none of these libraries want to hear, you know, the Daniel Boone system was able to get a 19 gigabyte connection, or whatever the heck. And, you know, why can't, we can't do that, you know, so they want to see other libraries are in their same boat. So that's a big um, plus for us we're trying to do. Um, I think we're going to have some good success with that. We've had that going on uh, for, we're going to have that going on for the next two years, roughly. And we're hoping to take the data from this and push it onto legislators and say, hey, look, this is what other states do. This is what we're doing. This is where we're at. This is what the libraries want to do. And now we have a way to, you know, ask for it on a bigger level and say, you know, we're future ready Iowa. Let's incorporate the libraries in that same goal. Um, and, Jay, is the, yep. is the state of Iowa ever make an appropriation specifically for technology investment in libraries? Uh, they do They do spread some funding around that way, um, it, but it's go, trying to go towards the whole library. Um, in, Rich, in Rich Iowa, I think it's called, and they, and they okay. give money out to the state, and they can spend it on stuff like whatever they like at the library. But is there a specific thing pushed to network them? No, I mean, in Missouri and Minnesota, some of these neighboring states, they have bigger networks that actually connect all the libraries and they help pay for that. And they do one big application that could, boy, that would be great if right. I could pull that off. Um, you know, that maybe that's down the road, but um, that, you know, that's certainly something we'd be interested in, in, in going through long-term and we're trying to build those connections because, you know, we're just, we're just working really hard to, to, um, make sure the libraries have a voice there at the table and, and, and working towards that. Um, and, I, and I think, I, you know, I really do think the library, you know, we've had a lot of good participation with this survey. We've had a lot of people learn a lot about their libraries and, you know, especially remember part of this too, it's not just, you know, the connections are important, but also making the space, um, getting the input with the community, you yeah. know, um, making the libraries more comfortable for people who are, bringing their own devices in, making the wireless really good. We're trying to get them to get new new wireless connections as well so that the Wi-Fi works um, better than, you know, a lot of times they just buy, a, they don't buy a commercial router. They buy one off the Home Depot. Right. It's for yeah. Walmart from their house. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't do all the things we want them to do. Um, we're talking about working too with um, the internet too. They're doing um, a nationwide sort of, um, bed with some um, some academics from uh, library school um, we haven't really totally fleshed out what we're going to do but we might be part of their expansion of this project and they would actually you know they're going into rural libraries all across the United States all across um, the country and just trying to um, put in devices that would actually measure the speed at the libraries you know, day and night, get a really great picture of how their usage is working rather than kind of like this anecdotal, like, well, it's really slow in the afternoon and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And, you know, they don't have that kind of data on that, that, you know, how the rural libraries are being used. That's a, you know, that is a very common issue when it comes to broadband in rural areas and it's d getting data to back up the anecdotal evidence that you hear constantly, whether we're in a community, you know, Todd and I have done studies in a number of communities and we've had conversations with people um, who are C-band members about this and we're always hearing, oh God, our broadband's really bad or, you know, people will s report that, um, you know, it slows down every day after school and those are all stories, but, uh, you know, the provider, if you go to the provider and say, hey, your internet's too slow, uh, they're going to come back to you and say, well, no, it isn't. We've, we, we prove it. <laughs> And so <laughs> having as much of that data as possible is a really important way to uh, uh, trace those uh, back, those anecdotal, uh, those stories back with some evidence. Yeah. And, and we're, and you know, we're excited about, 
the public schools in Iowa pushing one-to-one computer usage. I mean, that's excellent. We put a lot of money into on- online resources to, to, to help that, to encourage that, um, you know, and, and um, we're also encouraging a lot of homeschoolers at libraries, a lot of these different groups and, you know, they come in and they really do pummel the library with this stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, they drive yeah. out the adult clientele and all the kids come in. You know, <laughs> think so. that, that been there before. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, we're thinking also of including um, uh, better ways of counting their Wi-Fi usage. Um, that's mm-hmm. another big thing. We want that to be up there, up with their circulation, you know, because we have a lot of libraries, you know, well, the circulation might be going down or, you know, why don't, why are people not checking out books? But their, their library is being used all the time. Yeah. They have, you know, they're, they're only doing little samples of how much people are, are using their Wi-Fi. Um, you know, we want to get a really good picture of that. So we're thinking of, of, of supporting that somehow with some, uh, some solutions that would um, track that better. Um, even That's though, interesting. Yeah. You should mention that, Jay, because I was just at a small library in an eastern Iowa community, one of our amazing re- preserved old Carnegie libraries from a, the turn of the last century. And uh, I was talking with the librarian and, and, and said, well, we're actually going to do a webinar on this. And, and I said, you know, how long have you been here? And she said, 25 years. And uh, is your library get used as much as it used to? And she goes, oh my God. (laughs) She said, the foot traffic through our library has never been greater. It's just they're not walking out with books. They're as much as they used to. Some still are, but they might be walking out with DVDs. Uh, They might be walking out with a smile on their face because they finally got internet by coming to our library. But it's just a different kind of use structure now. Yeah, and and, and that's kind of, that's that's a perception. It's just really trying to get away from that you know, it's the library as a place. It's that third space. You know, it's the, it's not home. It's not school. It's not work. It's at that third space. It's that community center. And, you know, it, it, it's trying to get, you know, we're constantly overcoming that perception that, you know, it's a quiet, quiet place for your books. I mean, it, it needs to be that at times, but, you know, it, it, they're all very dynamic and they're all, you know, and, and libraries are trying to do new exciting things that they need big connections for too. I mean, I, I have a lot, I have some libraries that try and do virtual reality stuff. They're, you know, they're doing lots of, um, you know, video game events, STEM events, all kinds of things that they need a better connection because they've got to get this game or that game or, you yeah. know, they can't, you know, th- they're running um, 3d printers, that sort of stuff, just, you know, all over the place of, of what they need better connections for. And so that's a big, that's a big hope. For yeah. library, so I, you know, that's my slides, but <laughs> um, anything else you want to talk about, I will stop. Well, I, would, I would throw out there that <clears throat> the whole co-working, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole co-working movement in the United States virtual teams fits into where a library as a community center becomes a business center. And that story really doesn't get told very much because you're not paid to tell that type of story. And it's like two different worlds colliding. So anyway, that, like broadband fits in the middle of that, um, I think it's a good long term for libraries in general can can really support the business case because it's about you know sh- businesses are just shrinking footprint uh, mm-hmm. across the board, but those that community space becomes more valuable. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I you know my own personal experience as someone who you know my office is my home. Uh, I work wherever I am. A lot of times it's here, but if I'm on the road, uh, the first place I'm going to do, if I have a couple of hours between meetings in a community that I'm visiting, is I'm going to go find the public library and I'm going to find a table to sit down with the laptop and get some work done. And every once in a while, I'll walk out one of those public libraries and, and say, you know, I feel really bad. I got to come in here <laughs> and do business for free. And like they need a tip jar or something on the counter there that I can put a little money in to say, thank you for giving me a space to stay cool and get online. Um, it, it, but I think that as, as Todd mentioned, co-working, remote working, um, people earning their income outside of a traditional workplace as, as that continues to increase, it's going to only reinforce the value of those public libraries and other public spaces um, in, in, um, helping our economy, you know, as we transform into this new economy that we're already partially into. Absolutely. I mean, we're always trying to, 
to stress that, you know, that libraries are involved in there and the community development. And, you know, we try and get the library. It's hard for libraries to go out and do that, especially if they're one person part time. Mm-hmm. You know, but some of our bigger communities, they definitely do go out. They meet with the, you know, chamber of commerce. They're at, they send people to all that stuff to make sure that they're all aware, you know, the library's there and what it can do. Um, you know, and, and so, I, you know, all these things are great that we're talking about. I, I just, it's just such a big, a big, I, I've been trying to read more about fiber lately and, mm-hmm. and you know, try even like, I remember that Google, I used to live in Kansas city and I was excited. I left, but they put that Google fiber thing in Kansas city and I, and I heard it's kind of like, they're not going to expand it anymore, yeah. you know, but that was just fascinating to learn about, you know, that, that, ex, that, how that system worked and then compare it to like, South Korea and these places that, that have, have had fiber this whole time. And, you know, it just, I really want that to happen, you know, and trying to get overcome that burden, you know, that, that legacy system stuff and, and put that up top, you know, uh, for libraries, it's, it's going to be uphill climb. And, um, you know, I just, I, I think more than I read about this, the more I learn, it's like, we really need to have, think about fiber more. We need to have that be, there. Yes. um, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> you know, yeah. We're only going to yeah. need it more and it's not going to be there. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm hopeful, but you know, we, we have these discussions sometimes where it's like, we're having, we're going to get white space. We're getting broadcast, right. You know, we're getting the, the, the um, water tower has Wi-Fi shot into the library. Okay. That's cool. Let's, you know, that, that may not right. work everywhere in, in every circumstance. So, well, I just to bounce off of what you just mentioned, um, I'll encourage all our attendees, go to your local public library. If you don't have a library card already, get one and check out the book Fiber by Susan Crawford. Um, <laughs> It's, um, I, I, I started reading it and honestly, Jay, I got so depressed. I had to set it down because the first <laughs> it's chapter, on my desk. I've literally, that's what I'm reading. <laughs> is it really yeah. the first chapter you mentioned South Korea. That's why it reminded me of it. I'm reading about fi- how ubiquitous fiber connections are in South Korea and amazing broadband connectivity for a very low cost. And it just, it put me into a funk. I had to set the book down because uh, we're all, Todd, I, other people that are part of CBAN, other people that are just community advocates everywhere, are out there pounding our head against the wall trying to help communities figure out a way to get better broadband. But because there is no national plan, there is no um, uh, common uh, approach to it, um, it's just happening in little bits and pieces. So Winnebago County, like you mentioned, they are doing fantastic because they got a local provider up there that's community based, cares about their communities and does a lot of work to improve and, and invest back in their communities and they're getting things taken care of. But then you've got other rural areas where uh, it's just not happening. So it's, it's frustrating that we don't have that kind of um, approach, uh, a real strategy. Um, instead we have these little individual tactics that we're trying to do to fill these gaps. Yeah, and, and no, I think that's it's great that Iowa has so many independent telcos. Mm-hmm. Guys, it is, you know, and but you know, it some of those really can work good with E-rate, and then they can have sometimes that they don't. I mean, I had a library told once that they couldn't get their money because the the person who did it all was too busy farming and couldn't. You know, it's like it's on a deadline. You got to yeah. you got to come in and do the form, you know, and so that sort of thing is is we're trying we're, we're we struggle with that from time to time. But that's you know, yeah, well, overall, we've been pretty well served by having so many small community-based providers, uh, both those independents, as you mentioned, and municipals. But the challenge there is, in the end, each of them is an individual company operating under an individual budget and may or may not always have the resources to do everything that needs to be done, including supporting that local library. So, um, it, it, But if they make it a priority, right, and, and, and if – the message gets out like to the people on this call today and the work you're doing, Jay, um, it, that, that, that it should be a priority, then perhaps we'll start to see a little bit of that change. Yeah, that's absolutely. What I was excited about talking to you just to kind of say that, you know, fold your, fold the library in your conversation and, yeah. you know, uh, that, that they're really going to be that, you know, um, and there's a lot of people who don't necessarily use the library all the time. Sure. Um, in our communities that know about it, you know, I, I don't think um, that the, 
libraries sell themselves pretty well. I mean, they, they have good, good feeling around them. You know, people don't have terrible feelings about libraries. So it, that does kind of help. Um, you can get a little bipartisan support. So, right. you know, that it does keep that alive. <laughs> Thank goodness they haven't uh, become identified as part of big government. Um, and then that would be a reason for yeah. people to push back against them. Yeah. yeah. But, I, you know, don't want to get into too much of that. <laughs> that <laughs> definitely were. not. Um, good time to change the subject, right? Um, I wanted to just uh, mention to all our attendees, if you have a question, um, uh, uh, just join in with the chat window. You you'll, should see that at the bottom of your screen. Just hit the chat word and you can type in um, what you would like to ask a question we'll pass it to Jay or if it's for me or Todd but you got the real brainiac here today with Jay so we should ask them the questions some of you already chimed in earlier to tell me you couldn't hear me message received after I already figured that out but um, uh, so if you do have a question that you would like to ask of Jay just uh, chime in on the chat window um, so you know, the, we, we titled this conversation Digital uh, Bridge Over the Digital Divide, uh, Jay, and we talked about some of the things that, that, that libraries are doing to try to play an important role in that. Um, we talked about the inability of some libraries to get adequate broadband for various reasons. I'm just wondering, does the Iowa Communication Network, the ICN, at all play a role? Um, there was, I mean, there was a time that we had a lot of public libraries that had um, the ICN rooms. Have you ever been in an ICN room? Sure. You know, kind of how, yeah, and that that, that kind of was there, and that's kind of faded as, you know, that's kind of, they've kind of de-selected those. And yeah, in some cases, there might be some fiber from that ICN nearby the library, might be touching the library, but does it hook in? Do they have that connection, you know, literally across the hall? No. no. I mean, I got the you. ICN... Um, was doing long distance for them, you know, mm -hmm. thankful for that. I mean, I, you know, but that's, that, that I wish, I, that, that's that part that like other states have teamed up with their university structure and make big networks out of that. And they have, you know, the federal and, you know, they have the fiber networks already out there to all the regent universities or something and they connect the libraries at a central point. Sure. So we don't have, central points like that it just doesn't ever you know be great if we had a line we could run to a county library center that had branches right and then they, from there out to those branches yeah, yeah. yeah but the system's just not built that way nope um what i think that it seems to me that um that, that since the icn at some point became a huge political issue um, that's probably reduced the ability of the ICN to serve, to try to expand beyond its original mission. And, and, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why there probably hasn't been, haven't been any new extensions of the ICN to fill some gaps like this. Uh, it's kind of just static, stop, keep doing what you're doing, but don't do anything new. And nobody wants to let anybody else use it because they're worried it might hurt them. So yeah, I, well, you do not comment. I yeah. don't want you to get yourself in trouble. I've always said that the ICN is the third rail of, of Iowa politics, whereas Social Security is the third rail of national politics. You just don't touch it. It seems like the ICN is one of those here in Iowa, and it's, it's, it's a battle far beyond the capacity of this group to solve, that's for sure. Um, did you have something, Todd? I'm sorry. No, I was just... Agreeing that the run away, run away. conversations. Well, the you know, I was circling back to <clears throat> you. Really, don't have a, a statewide information gathering plan um, because you do have some infrastructure that's out there that people relate to that. But it, the discussions can be, you know, maybe should be different. Particularly to support your city councils. You know, people out there in the audience. It's like, what can you right. do? Well, it, all of these independent telcos and libraries and cities have, they have a financial process that goes through the budget money, whatever that right. process is. It's finding those policy makers at the right time to support getting better into, you know, making anything better in that community. Uh, it, it gets down to local level. Uh, the state, the state can't mandate things all the way down just because of the, there's nine, like you said, there's 500 some libraries, there's 990 cities. 
Yeah, and the county supervisor level. State. Oh, sorry, Todd. We're just a dispersed state, you know, of yeah. power, money, and and strategy. Yeah, and and even the the county supervisor level too. A lot of our libraries get a, a lot more money from the county than they get from their cities necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, in some cases. So, um, you know, if if you're personally invested in making it better, <laughs> that's another place you can go. Especially if you're you know not in a city limits or something. That you know, those are the folks that are. Yeah, um, working for you in contract, you know, they'll, they'll contract your service to a library, you know, by giving them funds and spreading that out. So, um, I, I would think too, there's probably a, 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 a diversity of level of awareness and interest in different communities uh, about the role that their library serves. I, I was just in a uh, community here in Eastern Iowa earlier this week where uh, I was there for a city council meeting and I was wondering why there were like 30 people in the council room, I said, I hope they're not here to hear what I have to say because they're going to be terribly disappointed. And no, they were there. Most of them were there because one of the items on the agenda was a consideration of changing the ordinance to uh, elect the library board members for four-year terms instead of six-year terms. Mm -hmm. And the library there in that community had such a strong group of supporters that they all felt it was important to go to the council meeting and express I don't even know which side they were on, but um, they were there to talk about whether or not the city should change the length of terms of the library board. So I thought that was extremely healthy and I was glad to get out of their way and leave so they could have that discussion. Uh, so um, we talked a little bit about the uh, um, importance of libraries for learning, obviously, both children and adult learners. We talked a little bit about the importance of libraries and the role that you have been playing and continue to play in, um, in uh, you know, improving access for um, workers, you know, uh, having internet there so those remote workers have a place to plop their laptop down and get some work and how that's growing. Um, what role does, li what does a library, a public library play in what I often refer to as digital literacy, which is just helping educate people who maybe are not into technology or using computers on a regular basis about the value of having those skills. Are libraries doing much of that or is, is it just kind of a, on a hit and miss basis? Well, I, Kurt, that's a great question. Uh, as I want to say, you know, if you're talking, there's, there's digital literacy and kind of information literacy and sometimes right. the two things run together right. with the patrons. Um, but I'd say the libraries do a big part of that. And I'd say the trend, a big trend they do is um, lately is uh, kind of doing device drop-ins. So, you know, they kind of say, okay, we're help you with Android or Mac or smartphone, whatever you're trying to work out. You know, did you know we can do wireless printing from your phone? So you don't have to, get all this stuff to work, you know, yeah, that's, that's stuff great. we're always trying to do. Um, but yeah, they get it, they get a huge role and they get kind of taxed with it because, you know, they, there's no way they know every device and they're struggling right. just as much, you know, but it definitely gets, gets, uh, gets used quite a bit. And, you know, um, it really varies and it, but of course it spikes after Christmas <laughs> every year because <laughs> yes. everyone comes in and says, okay, now I want to get eBooks on this Kindle I bought. Yeah. How do I do that? How do I yeah. use this, you know, um, your online, uh, audio books and eBook service. How do I use that? Yeah, sure. You know, Cause in case you didn't know, you can check out eBooks at the library. You can do that at your local library. If, if, if you're, if you're not fond of a physical book or, or need a good audio book for your drive, you know, you can get that at your local library. Yeah, don't don't uh, read your Kindle while you're driving. Um, I've <laughs> I've don't. been on the interstate and seen that a few times. It's just not healthy at all. No, no. Um, but yeah, that's one of our biggest uh, biggest circulation things out there is is those audio books you can download to your to your smartphone. Um, you know, get get that get that audio book out of the way while uh, while you're commuting. Yeah, it's a great way to. Great to acquire a great way to acquire knowledge or entertainment or just escapism while you're cruising down the road. <laughs> um, so really, Jay, in a way, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to keep hammering on this, but it seems to me that policymakers on a state and national level have not really done a very good job of developing a overall strategy for um, 
for libraries. Uh, it almost seems like it's every library for itself when it comes to what services they can provide and how they pay for those services. Is that, am I being too harsh on the, on the, on our policymakers there? I, you know, I would say that they, they, they try, I wouldn't say that's at this big federal overarching level. There is, there is agencies that kind of cover that. Okay. And they do that. Um, there's an, it's what called the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Which okay. In part started by um, Senator Harkin. Uh, and that, that system kind of helps lead that at the national level, you know, um, and kind of put outlines what libraries should be doing for good library, you know, best practices for service. Okay. Um, but, you know, in terms of tech, <laughs> it's all over the place. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, that kind of stuff falls on the American Library Association in general. Um, and they have an Office of Information Technology Policy and that group does a bunch of this sort of stuff along with, you know, privacy and first amendment and, you know, all those sorts of things and kind of getting sure. out in front of that and saying, you know, try, trying to come around on things like SIPA for libraries. Cause right. you know, it, that was a huge, that's a huge hurdle. And they were trying to come up with a way that they could make the two gel. And it's, it's very difficult. You know, and again, just to reiterate, um, you know, we talked about SIPA a little bit earlier, but that's just the, rule that is supposed to protect access to undesirable material by children on the internet, right? And that's it, something that libraries are obligated to provide. Um, Not on a, if they take E-rate funding. Right. 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 So, um, but yeah, they can, constitutionally, you can turn it off in theory uh, if, if the uh, patron requests it. So okay. if they're an adult, they can request they turn the the filters off and they can search things because you don't want to risk the filter impeding their information, that sort of thing. So okay. um, are you getting a question on Q and a, I don't know. I see a button there. Um, I don't know. Let me look and see if anybody does have a question, just uh, um, raise your hand to do it on the Q and a, here we go. Um, to follow up on what uh, Todd was discussing earlier, it seems that funding amounts to grow broadband is always public, but the next step is challenging. Is contacting local government representatives probably the best way to discover who is interested in expanding or installing broadband networks? Thoughts on that, gentlemen? I think contacting not only government officials, but also <clears throat> economic development staff and officials uh, early in the conversation helps drive a broader analysis and discussion in the community instead of just leaving it up to one lack of purpose like response um, that, that's just my experience is talking to one city council member doesn't build momentum mm -hmm. be getting uh, like-minded stakeholders early in the conversation uh, and having a broad conversation about how is my community participating in the 21st century economy Right. It really does have to broaden beyond just the role of one entity, one agency, such as a library. Um, right. One thing I'm always hesitating, uh, hesitant to do, uh, Jay, and, and something I, I didn't want to certainly imply in our conversation here today is that libraries are somehow, it's their responsibility to do all these things. We as a society share that responsibility, right? And it shouldn't just be dumped on the library staff, which is usually understaffed and overwhelmed to do these things. It should be up to community leadership. It should be up, honestly, the providers should play a more, a bigger role than they do today. Uh, it should be up to city, county, state governments and whatever to make sure that to feedback to what Todd was saying, this is about the digital economy. This is about work in the 21st century. This is about education in the 21st century. It's becoming more and more about healthcare in the 21st century. And, and that's why I always worry about when there's really, it's such ad hoc. One community is doing it really well. The other community doesn't have the resources to do anything. That's what I'm always concerned about. If, if communities, you know, what can these community leaders Obviously, people around this attending this webinar have enough interest to take an hour of time to think about it, right? What can they be doing back at their local level to make sure those decision makers are keeping libraries in the loop? That's because you kind of touch on healthcare too. 
Yeah. I mean, we've had a success in some of our towns that they, they're, they're lucky to have a hospital and the mm-hmm. hospital does a, like a planning group and then they all kind of lump in together and that's really great when that can happen. I was really excited. I got a few libraries that did that last year. And yeah, that's fantastic. So, you know, cause that, cause that, um, they get E-rate funds too. There's a, there's a uh, medical portion of E-rate as well. So rural, uh, rural, rural telemedicine health sort of <laughs> whatever it falls under. I forget what it's called. Yeah. I, I, there's, there's an entity or an agency that kind of covers that. Um, and you know, I, I We've talked to, I've talked to some of the people or the entities that are doing e-health or developing these programs, you know, and I think the concept is someday that you won't travel to a doctor in, you know, an hour and a half drive. You'll go to some location in your community where you can have an electronic contact with that doctor, whether that's a library, a school, a clinic, city hall, whatever, but, uh, you know, to, to get that access where maybe that access doesn't exist today. Um, another question just came in. Could you list the important state and federal library websites that I can share with our local library staff? Thank you, Marie, for that question. What are some of those that um, perhaps we can uh, pass along to people? Better have your pen and pencil ready, Marie. Um, state, state Library of Iowa, statelibraryofiowa.org. Uh, and uh, what that's, that's where our, our, our we have a bunch of st- you know, stuff we're always announcing information about, you know, initiatives here. Um, you know, if you're really interested in this topic, uh, the, I, the Shelby coalition, SHLBY, they, they do a lot of this advocacy for, uh, and they have really good, um, you know, they're, 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 they're talk, talking to the FCC and policy folks getting that done. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, even those internet, the internet to people, but the um, Urban Libraries Council is a really great resource for stuff. Um, I would also, if you're looking for really flashy, interesting things that kind of can tell you more about what libraries kind of do now. So if you're struggling, like, I know libraries do things that aren't the things that stereotypically think they do. There's a great website out there it's called Libraries Transform. And it has all these great, like, ready-made posters and topic areas and things that are, like, new 21st century plug in the library into the to the to the um uh world and kind of saying you know my library is for doing 3d printing it's not just for x or y you know it's it's for doing all these exciting things rather than you know so that's a way to kind of if you're if you're if you're working with a library helping a library that's that's a good place to start and you have a lot of that that good material so and of course, a lot of public libraries have some sort of friends of the library organization or something like that, a way for citizens to get involved by maybe financially contributing or volunteering your time or being on that four or five or six year library board or whatever. If, if you're a person like you might be in this group and you have lots of technical knowledge about broadband and you want to help your, I mean, boy, the library would love to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the friends or even the board of trustees, you know, kind of say, Hey, I know all the, all the kids in this town would love to have better broadband in the library. Let's get on that. You know, <laughs> And yeah. if they, if they got help writing an RFP or coming up with how that, cause I've had that happen, you know, libraries um, just, you know, they don't know what they don't know <laughs> at all. Yeah. Comes to that's so, typical. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Well, um, thanks for the, the question, Marie. I think what we'll do there, too, off of that, since we kind of put you on the spot to come up with websites and resources off the top of your head, Jay, there, is that we'll have you, uh, I'll communicate with you on some of those, and uh, we'll, we, we post our videos, our replay videos of the, the Lunch and Learns, and when we post this Lunch and Learn at broadbandaction.com, we'll include a narrative there that talks a little about with some links to those resources. So... Uh, if you weren't writing these down, um, you'll be able to check back in in a couple of days, a few days on broadbandaction.com, and uh, we'll have that information listed for you. So, thanks, thanks, um, thanks, thanks, thanks. you bet. Well, I think we're running up in against our little time window here. I am going to put in a little plug, as is my prerogative as uh, the guy running the show here a little bit, is to um, uh, uh, learn more about CBAN, the Community Broadband Action Network. Um, I'm going to show you what our website looks like, and uh, hopefully you will uh, go there and learn more. Now, if you aren't already a member of CBAN, go to broadbandaction.com, and you can go to join. We have four classes of membership. 
Um, several of you that are on the call today are community members, and those are people that are uh, in communities that have an interest in better broadband. Um, local advocates are individuals maybe not representing the city, but also are individuals who have an interest in broadband. Providers, that would be small companies uh, like Osage uh, Municipal Utilities that are advocates for uh, better broadband in their communities, and then vendors who are people basically that sell stuff to make bro better broadband happen. So those are the classes of membership. Um, all but the vendor memberships are free. So I'd encourage you to join and uh, keep uh, joining us in this participation and this conversation. So uh, with that, I think we will let everybody go today. Thank you for joining us on our CBAN Lunch and Learn. Um, and uh, keep listening to um, our Broadband Bytes, uh, uh, the uh, Broadband Bytes uh, newsletter and email that goes out because we'll be announcing what our next one is. Uh, a little hint, I'm trying to score a interview with Susan Crawford of said book, Fiber. It's uh, a very I'm, readable book. It really is. It's a very readable book, and I'm hoping she'll consent to uh, uh, – an interview because I talked to her a little bit at a conference I was at and I actually bought her book and got her signature on it. So, mm -hmm. um, I probably should, I should probably struggle through the tears of reading the first few pages before I uh, call her though. So, so thank you everybody for joining us here on our C-Band Lunch and Learn today and, uh, take care and have a great rest of your week.